Hi, welcome to the Signal Pad. I have here a Stanford Research Systems a model PS350 high voltage power supply. This is the last item that I picked up on eBay as a series of repair videos I wanted to do and I'm going to go back to a couple of reviews after this which are a little bit behind schedule and a few tutorials that I really really wanted to do for a while but this is the last instrument left on the repair list and I thought we'll take a look at it. And this is a plus and minus um, 5000 volt 25 watt power supply so you can generate all the way up to 5000 volts and I do have another high voltage power supply which I will show you in a moment it's a really old fashioned one and cannot do negative uh, directly unless you of course invert the polarity of whatever it is that you're connecting to but uh, I have a couple of ideas I want to do a few tutorials and a few experiments for a review I'm putting together where I needed a high voltage power supply and Stanford Research makes some really nice equipment and this is a broken one they, they can be quite expensive these units uh, when they're functioning and I'm interested in um, taking a look at it and see what's wrong with it and see if we can fix it and then uh, replace my uh, outdated power supply in my lab now one thing I want to point out is that you have to be always extremely careful with high voltage power supplies, it's needless to say. And uh, of course repairing anything uh, is dangerous as connected to the lines, but high voltage power supplies can be can particularly dangerous. So please, please be very, very careful uh, if dealing with something like this. Unfortunately, the schematic of the PS350 is not available. Even though the service manual is there, the schematic is not. And I, I searched around, I couldn't find it. I don't know if you're going to be able to fix it or not. Either way, uh, if you do have the schematic when the video goes up, share it with everybody uh, so we can take a look at it. And then we can go from there. So let's uh, take a close look at this and uh, let's see what it does. And look what we have here. Oh, look at that. Oh, that's not good. I see my lab equipment has come alive. Of course, as always, uh, Stanford Research <laughs> equipment it has a very, very uh, eccentric look to it. It's a very uh, it screams Stanford Research. They all have this big. Uh, red um, LED displays and so on and they have a rather, uh, rather antique looking um, interfaces nowadays and they haven't changed it as far as I know but they make really really nice instruments uh, I have a few other Stanford Research stuff in my lab uh, which I haven't shown you yet actually but anyhow so here there is the measured voltage being displayed here here's the measured current and here where you can set uh, this limit and the current and so on and blah 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 uh, over here so uh, we can go ahead and turn it on but before let me show you the back of this the output of the power supply is of course taken from the back of the unit and there's a couple of other uh, things you can adjust here actually this one is not equipped with the GPIB interface and it's actually missing a screw I just noticed that and uh, so you know it doesn't have that option but I guess you could add it it has option 01 I'm not sure what that is yet I'll look it up and also here's the output it has a special high uh, voltage connector of course this is not a BNC connector or something else and I don't have anything fortunate unfortunately to plug into here so we have to figure something out to safely connect this to the outside world it also has a polarity inversion in here so you can't just enter a negative number and, and, and it won't produce a negative voltage you have to manually flip this over and if you do that while the output is enabled you can damage it and this is primarily because when the output is charged let's say to 5000 volt and you're going to flip the switch while it's on it actually mechanically uh, flips the polarity of the transformer high voltage transformer and all the you know the diode capacitor ladders and so on so it, I, I, I think it's going to discharge it through the pad and actually put perhaps I could be wrong, but I think it may produce twice the voltage occasionally on some of the components or just discharge them through some of the components, causing some damage. So you shouldn't uh, flip it while it's on. This is uh, one of those things. That's why it doesn't have... I, I don't think it's actually missing a knob. I think this is how it's supposed to look like. So you can't, actually, you know, you can't really turn this with your finger. You're going to have to go out of your way and get a screwdriver and something to flip it. I think so. I, I don't think there's anything that's missing. There's also two BNC connectors, which is a set and monitor pin and an eye monitor pin. And there's a button here. When it's at the top, you're monitoring the voltage. So you can uh, monitor the voltage between 0 to 10 volts, which will be, I suppose, between 0 to uh, 5,000 volts. And if you flip the switch to the bottom, then you can set it. So you can have an analog voltage go in there between 0 to 10 volts, which then controls the output voltage. Something like this could be useful if you want to have an automated setup or if you have some analog voltage that you want to multiply by a very large amount. Remember this is a DC source, not an AC source. And here's an eye monitor between 0 to 10 volts, which I assume will map into uh, 0 to uh, 5 milliamps or so, whatever the, uh, the current is. I guess it would have to be 5 milliamps, because 5 milliamps at 5,000 volts is 25 watts. And then there's of course the, the fuse and then the plug and so on. So this is how it works. But before I connect anything to the high voltage port, I'd like to turn it on and see what happens. I just got the unit. By the way, it's extremely dirty. 
I don't know what has happened to it or where it's been uh, sitting all this time, but it's got a lot of stuff on it. There's some writing on it. So I usually like to work on clean equipment, so I'm going to also clean it before we move forward. But now let's turn it on just briefly and go ahead and, and plug it in. Make sure it's turned off and plug it in and let's see what happens. Here we go. Let me see. This is at the bottom. Yep. There it is. Um, all right. Well, uh, you can see it's on set. I've set to 100 volts. I guess I can change that. Let's say we set it to 150 volts. And then enter. There it is. So 150 volts. So I, I guess the processor must be working because obviously all these buttons seem to be reacting and so on. And if I put it in the middle, the output is off. I push the bottom and resets it. Now, as soon as I put it in the middle, it goes crazy. It says it's delivering two and a half uh, milliamps, but uh, to what? Uh, there's nothing there. And uh, it's displaying 2,466 volts, which obviously I'm not asking for. Let's go ahead and enable the output. Nothing. It still <laughs> says the same thing. So it's obviously wrong. Um, and there's 150 volts set, which is, uh, you know, the limit is set to 5,000. The I limit is 5.2 milliamps. It trips at 5.2 milliamps. The trip is a very useful function, by the way. And uh, yeah, that's it. Nothing. Oh well. Okay, well, so this obviously not doing anything. Now, there's two possibilities. Either 2,466 volts is actually present at the back. I highly doubt that because it's reporting this current. And the output at the back is open. Uh, so, it, unless it's leaking somewhere. And this is an extremely stable voltage. Uh, yeah, nothing. So um, I don't think this is right. Right? Uh, it could be the component, the part of the circuitry inside that monitors the output voltage could be damaged, or something else. Uh, I don't think it's producing anything. I haven't checked. But let me clean it up. Connect it to a multimeter in a safe way. Remember, this is 5,000 volts. It's beyond uh, the CAT1 and CAT2 and so on, so you have to be very, very careful in terms of voltage rating, uh, what you connect it to. I don't have any multimeter here that can directly measure more than 1,000 volts, so you're going to have to make a resistor divider uh, to do that. So, just clean it up and uh, build something and see what happens. So here's a very, very quick setup I put together to measure the output voltage in case there is 2,500 volts sitting there and we want to make sure that we can measure it safely. Now, I don't have the cable, so I've just put together something. Uh, it's not the greatest, but it, it, should, it should do the job for now. So I've taken the center output directly with this cable. Now, this is not a high voltage cable. It is sitting off the table, and uh, if there is a problem at this point and a spark would happen, it would just jump the gap and it would trip the instrument, so it shouldn't be a problem. Everything is turned off right now, of course. And the output then goes into this 1 giga ohm resistor, and that 1 giga ohm resistor gets divided by a factor of 10, uh, a roughly factor of 10 to 100 mega ohm resistor which then goes to ground. Now the output impedance of a multimeter is 10 mega ohm so you really don't need a 100 mega ohm resistor, this is just for safety just to make sure if something happens and it opens up that you don't have 2,500 volts you still get the division. So in reality you're dividing between 1 giga ohm and 10 meg in parallel with 100 meg which is roughly let's say 10 meg so you're dividing it by a factor of 100 uh, and then uh, the ground is connected here and the output is taken from uh, the high side of the resistor here at the bottom. So this guy basically is a voltage divider, very straightforward, except that the high voltage portion, which is from here to the resistor, is up in the air using this little uh, cardboard uh, cutaway that I've made, and everything else is, is separate away from everything. So it should be pretty pretty easy. Uh, of course, I'm using the Fluke 29 completely isolated, sitting on top of the instrument. I won't touch anything, and it's plugged in, so I'm going to go ahead and turn it on. There you go. The instrument is turned on. It's just off camera. You can't see it. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's going. I'm going to go ahead and enable the output. And no, nope, the light is on, but nothing comes out. So this just at least verifies that there is absolutely no voltage coming out. So something has gone horribly wrong, and we'll have to figure it out. So now I'm going to disassemble it, take it apart, and we can take a look inside. And we can even reassemble it while it's open. But I don't really want to do that. Let's see if we can figure out the problem without having to. Uh, plug it in like this when the instrument's open. But anyway, it should be interesting to take a look and do some uh, reverse engineering. All right, here's a look inside the unit. And uh, you can see this is a fairly old unit. I, I think it is. I haven't checked uh, the data. I'll probably find it written somewhere. But you can see it has essentially no surface mount component except this little hybrid little thing they've built here in the middle, uh, which is two surface mount components. They 
might be op amps I have to check and they plug into a socket and they basically turn them into a dip package uh, there's a bunch of other components there here's a I believe a, a reference uh, voltage from a linear technology right there uh, here's the uh, firmware most likely it looks like to be some flash memory perhaps the uh, the, some some you know recording some settings and so on. I'm not exactly sure. A couple of um, non-populated components here. Here's a, a connector which might be uh, well you know guess as good as mine. It could be the GPIB although it's really far away. I'm going to take a closer look and find out what some of these components are. But you know overall it's very uh, well it's reasonably obvious what it looks like uh, and how it works. You can see the input filtering line filtering over there. Here's the main transformer of course going there. There's two diode rectifier bridges, a couple of capacitors of course for generating various DC voltages and so on. There's a few components here on the wall most likely some regulators and you know uh, perhaps maybe switching transistors I'm not sure uh, by the proximity of these couple of components here to these three lines which go into this high voltage box I would say these are the drivers for the high voltage transformer that's likely in here because I don't see a high voltage transformer here remember that this is this thing is essentially a DC DC converter in a way because the AC line comes in becomes DC and then it goes through some circuitry uh, it becomes some kind of an AC signal goes into a transformer which is then uh, perhaps a diode capacitor rectified and so on and I'll talk a little bit about that perhaps later and then the high voltage comes up there is also some uh, lines here which are going back into this part of the circuit perhaps uh, some monitoring uh, or something and then if you look carefully it's actually quite difficult to see there's two other lines coming out of here and those two lines actually are coax and they go into right here in this part of a circuit and uh, they're plugged in like this and there's the two other lines these two coax lines here they go in the back here so uh, the I monitor and the voltage monitor the voltage input are plugged in directly into here this I think might be the monitoring voltage coming back and uh, going around in here everything else is uh, pretty uh, pretty standard I'm sure you're curious about what some of these components are so I'm going to try and figure out some information about these just so we can have an idea about what's on the board again I don't have the schematic unfortunately there is nothing at the back at least I don't think there is there is you can see the back is uh, completely empty here's the line switch here it's not plugged in of course yes. and uh, here's the, again the filter the back of the transformer and the back of this board and uh, I can't really see anything inside that yet oh I see a very large capacitor to be expected a very high voltage capacitor right there pretty interesting even though this is this has been unplugged putting your finger in there playing around with it still dangerous even though I didn't measure anything just to be on the safe side be always very very careful discharge everything before uh, touching it so let's go I'm gonna take a quick look around and see uh, what's on this board should be fairly interesting so just taking a look at a few of the more of these components uh, this Zilog or Zilog or I'm not sure exactly how it's pronounced this is a 4 megahertz processor obviously this is the main core processor the firmware must be again in here this is a UV raisable uh, chip here and uh, there is a whole bunch of 74,000 logic series ICs on this and a whole bunch of op amps on here this is a linear technology 10 volt 5 part per million uh, per degree Celsius uh, 10 volt reference like I said and uh, again there's a bunch of the, the stuff for the power supply and a whole bunch of op amps it's very traditional mixed signal analog circuit design straight up I love it and again like I said the uh, structure is very straightforward now this thing comes in a couple of different models this is the highest voltage model the lower voltage models 2500 volts and 1250 volts or so on they go into they go higher currents but they all deliver the same amount of voltage and that means that the only difference between the different versions of this high voltage power supply is going to be the um, frequent the uh, voltage multiplier and they're most likely are going to have more uh, diode capacitor com combination so instead of you know doubling tripling and quadrupling the voltage uh, as a ladder of um, diodes and capacitors with a transformer in it and this again also makes sense why uh, the switch at the back is manual because uh, the only way to reverse the polarity is to physically switch over because this is a uh, AC signal going in and turning into DC so you have to manually flip the polarity of the transformer and so on so looks uh, pretty straightforward other than the fact that it doesn't work uh, so let's go ahead and power it on and again not enable the output and start simple now my intuition again was uh, to start from somewhere where I felt the feedback 
uh, voltage was being monitored and I'm looking here and I see these two uh, wires come out and there's a component hiding here and I, unfortunately I don't think you can really see it very well but let me see if I can do it like this there in there there is a component here now that's an op amp that I think the, the model number for it is LF 412 CN that's a op amp in there uh, that's connected to these now if these are going to be uh, connected to an op amp then it's likely going to be uh, somewhere perhaps the voltage is being monitored so that's a should be an interesting place to start uh, looking just you know measured making sure it has the right power supplies and make sure the input and outputs are match as they expect to be or if it's um, maxed out to a rail that is actually reaching the rail it could be that the arm pump is dead or something but it's a good place to start um, the other place to start is of course checking the DC uh, voltages that have to be present here in the power supply section because this is what feeds everything of course now the, the fact that the front panel turns on and everything is working uh, otherwise the processor is on at least some of the voltage obviously are there most likely the 5 volt digital rail is there but this is going to need a whole bunch of uh, voltage regulators as you can see most likely these are uh, some kind of regulators by their proximity to the rectifiers and the cap uh, filtering capacitors they don't seem any bulges in here the capacitors seem to be okay and uh, excellent brand capacitors and uh, let me see they are 85 degrees rated not 105 this one is 105 degree rated these transistors in here as I was mentioning are most certainly the drivers for the transformer that's inside the voltage multiplier here so I wouldn't look at that yet but I'd be interested in looking at some of the voltages in here that should be a good starting point I think you know safe safe thing to start is looking at the voltages so let me plug it in uh, get a multimeter and give it a try so I flipped it around a little bit easier to reach and now you can uh, take a closer look at these components I was just looking at them uh, while I while it was in a better light so um, where is my little pointer here so this is a 7815 which is of course a 15 volt regulator 7915 a negative 15 volt regulator 7805 5 volt regulator and this is a power transistor power MOSFET and these are as well so uh, therefore we have our triple power supply right here and uh, we can uh, easily check that obviously the 5 volt supply is there uh, otherwise you wouldn't get uh, anything uh, I'm not sure about the plus or minus 15 I haven't checked but surely that plus or minus 15 supply must appear on all the op amps uh, that of course have the reference monitor and so on so uh, we can go ahead and, and give that guy a quick check now it's really difficult uh, to be honest to reach around here and do this so I'm gonna do my best here there is a ground terminal somewhere in here if I can find it uh, which is right over here and I should be able to uh, go ahead and measure uh, carefully around the corners turn this on let's see make sure the output is off and it is there we go the LEDs are yep they're turned on let me get the ground over here there we go one of these pins should be our 15 volt regular output 25 that's got to be the input oops that's the ground three <laughs> what hold on let me try the minus 15 just to make sure I'm not making a mistake here that's the ground that's the input and there it is minus 15 so I am measuring the right thing let me try the 5 volt here there's a 5 volt bingo that's there what is going on 3 volts input 26 output 3 unbelievable could my very very first measurement on the board actually be the problem that's, that has never happened that's a boring problem I was hoping for something really really uh, interesting ah huh? well there's still hope maybe that failure is somehow a cascade failure and it has caused a uh, failure on all the other components and we can maybe have uh, more, more fun fixing it there's no guarantee that, that that fixing something like that will actually bring it back to life but let me just double check just to make sure is it really that stupid yeah 3 volts alright yeah input is indeed 26 that in 26 volt input is certainly coming from uh, the full bridge rectifiers unbelievable uh, what is going on with that well there's one other thing I want to do just to make sure I'm gonna go ahead and measure that op amp that I initially 
intuitively thought uh, would be an issue. Does it really have plus or minus 15 volts on it? Because it should. Uh, that's that's it's most likely running from that supply rail. So let me turn this off. Get a little bit closer, somewhere where I can. You know what? I'm gonna have to flip this over. Here it is. I'm I'm gonna try and measure that op amp uh, to see if it's actually on the same rail. Here we go. Turn this guy on. Now I've looked at the pin out of the op amp. I should be able to double check. It's a very a very awkward angle. This pin over here is the V minus. There it is. Minus 15 volt. Now pin. I'm gonna have to get up here. The pin on the other side should be the plus 15. Let me see if I can reach it. Three volts, unbelievable. It is the plus and minus 15 volt rail that is the problem. At least one of the problems. Man, I think I do have a, a plus 15 volt regular. I should be able to replace that. I don't know why it has failed. That's troubling fact itself because who knows what is going on. It could be that something else is a short, is drawing so much current, is bringing it down to three volts or some other uh, thing is a problem. That's, that is just uh, crazy to me that uh, this failure has happened. Let's take a closer look at that uh, part here. Let me see if uh, how good the zoom on this will work for us. Let me see if it will focus. Oh, it will focus. There it is. There, the component on the left. And you should be able to hopefully read uh, the 78 15 return on it. The 79.15 which is right next to it. Let me center it in the frame. Sorry about that. Here we go. The 78.19 seems to be working. Ah, that's unbelievable that the first measurement was on the part that doesn't seem to be working. And there it is. And uh, it should be very easy to replace because again I have access to the back of the board so I should easily be able to uh, do that. And this is obviously assembled uh, either after they screw this to the to the chassis. Most likely they push it into the part and then screw it to the chassis. At least that would be my guess. We can see uh, the, the input, the ground and the output pin here. And uh, you know I'm looking at the LCD screen here. You know I'm not fully convinced that's actually connected even. You see that? Oh my god it's not even connected to the board. Are you serious? That's the output. Unbelievable! <laughs> they are not connect. How, how the hell is that even possible? These are connected. Yeah, pretty, pretty solid. These are separated. Oh, my, I know what is going on. All right, here we go. Are you ready for this? Here's a lesson for chassis design. Look at this. You notice what's gone wrong? Here's where the transformer is. The transformer is screwed to the edge of this chassis, this thin aluminum plate. This thin aluminum pl plate, look at that, you see that? It can wiggle, it can move, and the weight is here, so the, the displacement is going to be less and less moving away from this. If this transformer bangs around like that, this whole piece is going to move around. And due to, you know, this thing vibrating over time, those connectors from the regular that have been sheared off from the board. That is a very, very, very interesting failure. Let me see. Let me focus in here. Look at that. Look. You see that? That whole thing can shift around because of the weight of the transformer. There's a, that's a bad design right there. The fact that this, uh, this cannot move with respect to that, bad. This should, these should be an isolated uh, heat sinks. They are trying to use the chassis as a heat sink, which is a very, very common technique. But this is screwed to the chassis. Displacement has caused this problem. Oh, at least we saw something interesting, uh, despite the failure. So, how will I fix it? Well, I could just solder it over for a quick fix around, just so we can see it. Obviously, I cannot solve this problem. This is fixing the chassis. But uh, I, I should be able to repair it. Let me go ahead and, and bend the pins back <laughs> and uh, put a blob of solder on it, closing the gaps nicely and then uh, just just as a quick fix we can always replace the part and have brand new leads and so on but uh, let me see let me go ahead and try let me let me check to see if I have a 7850 maybe I'll just replace it so it turns out I don't actually have a 7815 unfortunately I have like 20 7812s but that's not gonna help uh, here if you look closely to what I did I just basically soldered over it because I was uh, too impatient to wait uh, 
for a new part to arrive. It's an easy replacement, but you can now see that the connections are made, but surely uh, if this thing bangs around, it's gonna fail again. I wonder, I mean, I don't know if it works or not, but if it does, it would be interesting maybe replacing it. But anyhow, that's, uh, <laughs> that's all I've done. Well, let's go ahead and uh, plug it back in. Now, I'm not gonna close it completely. It should be safe to operate uh, with the case off, but not with this, so I cannot take this off, actually, I will not. But anyhow, let's go and see what happens. I'm very curious. All right, here we go. Let me see, I can reach around, turn this on, and <gasps> look at that, <laughs> unbelievable, <laughs> it doesn't say 2.5000 volts anymore, it's uh, at 4 volts apparently, that's that's remarkable, so here it's set to, Is it, what is going on here, okay, so that's the limit, the current limit, okay, it's set to 0, if I turn it on, it goes to 11. Okay, I don't know why, but uh, let me uh, turn it off. Let, let's let it to something, you know, more interesting. Let's go, I don't know, uh, 500 volts. 500. Enter. And then we enable. Ah, look at that. 501, 502 volts. And I can't believe it. It came back to life. That was it. I mean, I haven't measured the output voltage, but it's far more promising than it was before. All right, you know what, let's, let's go ahead, let's plug it in, let's measure the upper voltage. So here for the sake of completeness, I wanted to show you what's inside this high voltage module. I cannot completely take it apart without a lot of trouble because it is connected to the solder to the board, but it's enough to get the idea that I was trying to get across. So here on one side of it, you can see our voltage quadrupler. Here are four output capacitors there in a part of the ladder and you can see they're each rated to 4000 volts. They will not see each 4000 volts of course and there's a really big capacitor here that's directly at the um, across the output. This is the output right here, this point right here. In the center you can see the high voltage uh, and BNC uh, connected there. This is what switches the polarity of the voltage. You can see it's a hefty big mechanical switch that's obviously going to be connected to our transformer. Now if I flip it over here and just we can just barely peek in here and uh, yeah, there we go bingo here's our transformer as suspected here's our diode array I hope you can see that it's difficult there's our diode ladder right there and a bunch of other uh, resistors and this must be part of the oh, I think I'm blocking it this must be part of the resistive ladder which is responsible for dividing the voltage which can then be monitored so there's two voltages that are going out more, are most likely as I suspected they go around the op amp up there were exactly what I thought uh, they are the monitor voltage so you know it looks pretty nice uh, pretty straightforward so this unit is the quadru voltage quadrupler in this case so I'm gonna go put it back together so we can do some tests with it all right so here's our setup again just a quick reminder again we have one giga ohm 100 mega ohm and this, this is the 10 mega ohm roughly 10 mega ohm input impedance of this so the ratio is about a factor of 10 it's not exactly but it's about a factor of 10 so if I set this to uh, 500 you expect to see you know five volts or so around here so it's not exact but it should get us going so let's go ahead and turn it on uh, yep plugged in let me see all right uh, set to 500 and on wait on there you go look beautiful look at that 5.3 volts 5.3 volts so roughly about 500 would be it's it looks like it's it looks like it's back to life. I don't know how well it's calibrated. We're gonna have to do a direct uh, input measurement to find out. Uh, but yeah, 500 looks good. Let's let's try uh, let's try a thousand. There you go. Beautiful on the display. By the way, it says a thousand and two. Uh, here it's eleven. So again, it depends on the the division ratio. And I should be able to measure up to a thousand volts uh, without any resistor divider because this thing can, can measure a thousand volts. This is very dangerous. Be very, please be very, very careful if you do something like this. This is not an appropriate setup, especially the way I have it connected. There is a high dielectric breakdown special cable that is intended to be connected. It's not turned on right now. That's why I'm touching it. But uh, please be very careful. I'm, I'm not going to go over a thousand because at some point the dielectric in the air dielectric here will break down anyway and the spark will jump so we cannot go higher than a certain amount. If I disconnect everything we can set it to 5000 volts because there's nothing connected and it should be rated to operate without any cable 
and not break the dielectric as it has a Teflon dielectric between the high voltage and the ground. But nonetheless, we should be able to measure something. So right now it's set to zero volts. Let me go and enable the output. And indeed, when it's set to zero volts, it does register about 14 volts or so. The screen is reading 16, so it might be a little bit out of count. That shouldn't be an issue. We probably can fix that. Uh, let's go ahead and set it to 100 volts. There we go. Look at that. It's pretty accurate. I don't know why when you set it to zero, it doesn't give you zero. But anyway, 100.5, That's the display is reading 102. So it's a little bit different. Uh, I don't know what the output impedance is. I should also mention that I don't know what the output impedance is, but it should be able to deliver up to uh, uh, 5 milliamps. And right now it's delivering 10 microamp, which makes sense. 100 volts over 10 mega ohm, about 10 microamp. So let's go to 500 volts. Enter. There we go. Look at that. It's, it's brilliant. It's brilliant. Exactly 500 volts. I, I love it. And the current is 50 microamp. It's, it, it's dead on. It's exactly what it should be. And uh, let's go to 990. There we go. 990. Brilliant. A thousand. Just the highest I should be able to go. <laughs> A thousand volts is uh, it's very, very accurate. Alright, so this is what I was talking about. So let me res reset it and then uh, go on. You can see it's set to 10 volts. And when it's completely open, it's reading 25. Um, it's, there's absolutely no current, of course, because there's nothing connected. But let's try uh, 3,000 volts. There you go. 3,000 volts, you see? That surely is accurate. It's reading the correct value for sure. And the maximum is 5,000. Oh, it makes a little bit of a, a you know the static discharge sound as as the capacitors charge and uh, things <laughs> things uh, are exposed to a st strong electric fields. But yeah, five thousand volts set it back to zero. There you go. You can see it discharging back down to zero. So it looks uh, it looks fine. Uh, let me also reverse the polarity because we never tested that. And so here we can test the negative voltage and here what I've done is I'm actually connecting the my Fluke 289 to the voltage monitor output of the instrument and that voltage monitor will go from 0 to 10 volts uh, for 0 to 5000 volts. So it's a factor of 500 whatever voltage this is producing you can divide by 500 and you should be able to read right over here. So uh, I, now this is a negative now of course even though this is set to negative this will still only produce 0 to 10 volts so let's say you know, set to 300 volts here and I'm going to go ahead and enable the output. There it is you can see it says minus 300 volts and this is at uh, 0.605 and if you multiply that by 500 of course you get about 300 volts. So it does seem to work um, rather nicely the voltage monitor portion is also functional so I can go to 5000 which would be negative 5000 and here we go. You can see that at minus 5,000 volts, it gives us 10.00, almost 10.000, which times 500 again is minus 5,000. And another thing I want to point out is that um, th this thing is actually not, you cannot calibrate this, unfortunately, uh, by any potentiometers inside the unit. The calibration is stored in the firmware. And I downloaded the firmware from the IC, and I have it, and I haven't really looked at it to try and reverse engineer it, but I can put that on the website if anyone's interested to take a look and modify it and I can then upload it into this and figure out what happens but at very low at zero volts it is I'm not entirely surprised for example that you know there is some spurious voltage reading even though this is set to zero volts and there is no load at all remember that this thing has to have a voltage divider at the output which is capable of dividing 5000 to a, to a much much lower ratio such that the ADCs can sample so when you set it to zero volts you're really running into the noise floor of the ADC perhaps and this is why it's difficult uh, for it to be able to uh, provide you very low low voltages if I were to load this then the voltage actually goes much much closer to zero but you know it's to be expected it's not that big of a problem and since we're talking about high voltage generation we can briefly talk about the Cockcroft Walton uh, voltage multiplier which is a really basic structure of capacitors and diodes I used to build this when I was in high school without knowing much about it at the time and gladly didn't really hurt myself but you have to be very very careful about how these things work uh, the idea here is that you have an AC source here in our case uh, in the case of the Stanford research I'm not sure if they're using this exact structure but there is a transformer there and that transformer has its primary 
coil driven and driven perhaps by some power transistor through some PWM signal generation and then that creates a high voltage AC signal which we uh, appear here. That high voltage AC signal is then multiplied by this ladder of diodes and capacitors to create even higher higher and higher uh, voltages which will then be DC. Now this is a times 8 uh, multiplier. So the idea is that the first capacitor and diode are an AC doubler so it takes the AC signal and shifts it up by the amplitude of the signal that is applied to it and then you have a rectifier that follows it and that creates that peak signal and then turns it into a constant DC voltage. So now for the second step of the ladder your reference voltage has moved from ground to twice the AC amplitude that you had here. So then this cycle repeats and it will cont continuously multiply the voltage. Of course, none of these components will see the final, final high value of the voltage because it's there in series. So you have the voltages in series with equal amplitudes across all of the capacitors so that they never have to be rated at the highest amplitude. Now, another thing to notice is that as you increase the multiplication factor, the current driving capability of the final node drops. That's for a couple of reasons, and you, know, you can think about it intuitively. First of all, these capacitors now appear in series, so the total capacity goes further lower and lower, which means that you have less uh, available current before you can discharge them. The total capacity has gone down, but your voltage has gone up. Furthermore, uh, the last, last signal here will require multiple cycles of the signal at the input before it reaches the output signal. That means that as you draw current, you need more and more cycles of the of the signal at the input before you can replenish the charge that used to be here. So if you continue increasing it, you can deliver less and less current. And there are other challenges associated with the way the impedance varies. So you can't just continuously increase the frequency. There's a whole bunch of different reasons. But it's interesting to note that this is, doesn't come in a sense for free. Of course not. As you increase the voltage, something else has to go and then current will go down. The current delivering capability of the circuit will continue to go down. And this is a very simple and easy, this is a non-symmetric one, you can actually flip it over and have a completely symmetric structure. I'm not exactly sure even if this is what is used in this unit. But having said that, uh, the connector at the back is an SHV connector, which is a high frequency connector. It's not a BNC. I may have said BNC uh, by mistake, but I did buy a cable. It hasn't arrived yet for me to connect it. Now, I, I want to go, don't want to go through too much detail here because there's lots of information about this circuit already available. And I'm here, uh, curious to hear back from you guys about what kind of experiments uh, you'd like me to try with this high voltage power supply. But, you know, just as the end of the video, we can make a little spark. That should be fun. Now, one other thing I wanted to mention is that in this system, we have a closed loop. So the PWM is adjusted here. The output voltage is divided with a resistor divided, which is then fed back and continuously adjusts the signal driving the transformer. So we have a closed loop, and that's how we can set the voltage. So here what I've done is I'm taking the, uh, the high voltage output, again I don't have the SHV connector yet, but I'm taking the output and I have a very very small gap between these two cables here, which then connects directly back to the ground. Again, a very very dangerous setup, but it should give us a little spark. So let's go ahead and uh, focus right over here, and I'm going to give it a good, good old 5000 volts uh, in one, one set. Are you ready? Here we go. Bam! I don't know how that looks like on camera, but this trips the instrument and disconnects the output. And this is one of the advantages of having uh, the tripping capability uh, built into the unit, such that as soon as something like this happens, the unit shuts off and it's safe again. Uh, it's very, very useful uh, in this case. My old unit that doesn't actually have that, it will continuously create uh, a spark, and arc, but it can deliver much less current than this. It cannot deliver 25 watts like this one can. And the other thing that's interesting to note is that because I can apply a voltage here, instead of monitoring it, I can actually apply an analog voltage and have that voltage be multiplied by 500 and come out as a high voltage. So this is in a sense like a 500 volt per volt uh, gain amplifier as well. So you can have some interesting uh, you know, things you can do from the fact that you can put that again in a feedback loop and do some funky stuff with it. I have some ideas, but we can perhaps uh, think about it later. Either way, I hope you enjoyed uh, this video and you know the fact that we figured out what was wrong with it, even though it was a simple problem but nonetheless we got to see what's inside it take it apart talk a little bit about the theory and i thought it was a fun video so let me know what you think leave a comment uh, if you like the video give it a thumbs up and i have a bunch of reviews which i have to prepare for next so i hope you look forward to that